Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman. You can find this show here at American Freedom Radio, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. Well, uh, we have a, a busy first hour today on the show. We are going to be talking about the sixth season of Homeland, the season premiere uh, of Homeland, episode one, which is called Fair Game. And uh, joining me to discuss this is my good friend and frequent collaborator, Tom Secker, of course, of spyculture.com, uh, where you can find all of his work and, of course, his podcast, Clandestime. Uh, Tom, how are you? Yeah, okay. I've been better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, Tom is uh, suffering through a cold, as I was uh, a, like a, a week or two ago. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to get through uh, today's episode. Um well, I guess, I mean, uh, first things first, Tom, it's been, it's been a while. It's been a year since we covered Homeland. Um, faithful listeners will remember, of course, that we did, uh, an episode by episode show, um, which we decided against, uh, this time around. Um, but, uh, what were your, what were your impressions? Did you, did you like this first episode? Are you excited for the season? Uh, what was, you know, your, your initial thoughts? Uh, completely divided in two. As a piece of, like, entertaining drama, I thought it was crap. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> as a piece of, like, political theatre, or politicised theatre, I should say, I, I actually thought it was dead interesting. I think they've set up a whole bunch of stuff which I'm assuming is going to pay off in a more entertaining way as this season goes on. Mm. Um, yeah, I actually... Because we were talking about this before, how... Homeland has this problem of constantly trying to reinvent itself. It's partly a hangover from, like, they dragged on the whole Brody thing for too long. Yeah. Um, at least one season too long. <laughs> and ever ever since then, they've sort of reinvented the show radically each season. Mm. So it's like almost like it's existing in a whole new world and certainly in a whole new location. Um, and this season, it doesn't look like it's going to be all about spies. It looks like mm. it's very much going to be about politics, which is certainly a welcome addition to, to the show. Um, I'm, I am certainly interested to see where all of that's going. They've set up some interesting stuff there. I just felt bored, to be honest, by the mm. first episode and a, and a little bit depressed. The whole Quinn storyline had me a little bit depressed. Yeah, for people, I mean, you know, uh, warning right now, full spoilers for this episode and all previous episodes of Homeland, but uh, Quinn, uh, his nightmare never ends. He's still alive. Um, Carrie is still, you know... Um, very much a factor in his life. Uh, yeah, I, that, I don't know what they were thinking or why they went with that. Um, there really isn't much point to having Quinn around. Um, mm. I, I, I kind of had a similar, um, feeling to this episode. I think, again, this is the first episode of a brand new season. Um, so they are, you know, the way Homeland works, they do sort of reboot everything. So, I think that's partly why this episode felt fell a little flat. They're kind of trying to establish everything. Carrie now lives in Brooklyn. Um, and we'll get to some of the, the locations later. Uh, she's got a new job. Franny is living with her. She's no longer a CIA agent. She works now at a small legal firm or advocacy group that helps uh, Muslims, uh, Muslim Americans who are accused of terrorism. Uh, they, you know, they, they help defend them. And, um, I, yeah, I think, I think there will be more sort of spy versus spy stuff happening. Um, you know, in the trailer, it seems like, I don't know, Saul gets kidnapped yet again. Um, uh, and I think it's when he's, he's, he's gonna be somewhere like in the West Bank or Gaza maybe. Uh, but it definitely seemed like an Israel Palestine heavy sort of subplot is gonna be happening. Um, and I thought, and maybe before we kind of jump into the stuff that, you know, jumped out at us i actually wonder if this season won't be a bit more of like an emotional season 
Um, I think the politics are going to be very important, but there, you know, there's like, like the Quinn freaking out, um, is a very kind of powerful moment in the show. Not one that I liked necessarily, but it did kind of hit me. Um, mm-hmm. and it, I wonder if there isn't going to be a bit more of the kind of, you know, personal, interpersonal relationships going on. It seems like we're going to finally learn a little bit more about Dara Dahl. Uh, his personal life, which I can't wait to see, um, you know, Saul and Carrie's relationship, uh, Carrie and Otto During's relationship, this uh, the um, billionaire uh, German guy that she used to work for, who, uh, for whatever reason, like all men in this series, is obsessed with Carrie uh, and, you know, can't seem to get away from her. Um, so I don't know, Tom, did you, any, any thoughts on that, on the idea of this being a bit more of like an emotional season? I think you're probably right. I think you're probably right to expect more of that from this season, certainly than the last season. The last season had too many characters in it for that to really work. Mm. You know, you had all of these complex interlocking storylines where you had the foundation and the journalist, you had the hacker, and, you know, you just had so much stuff going on that they didn't really leave themselves a lot of space for where are you actually going with the emotional stuff. And for what it's worth, in the last season, Quinn and Carrie were hardly ever together. Mm. They're only really reunited at the end after he's been gassed with this horrible poison and it doesn't leave much space for them to go anywhere. And, you know, we th- we all thought he was dead. Well, he was dead. Let's face it. He yeah, yeah. No, that that character dead. is dead. dead. It's, yeah. it's like the beginning of um, Skyfall when they kill off mm. James Bond and then bring him back to life after the credit sequence. And you're just like, <laughs> hang on, I'm, he's dead. We just saw him die. <laughs> but whatever. And I think you're probably right, because the thing with Quinn that I was wondering is why have they gone to such lengths to make this guy suffer? And I think it's partly because they thought, if we're going to bring him back, we have to make him sympathetic. Mm. We have to make people not go, oh, for Christ's sake, that guy's back. We wish this guy should be dead. He shouldn't be in the show anymore. Um, As much as I like the actor and as much as I like the character, it reached a logical end point at the end of the last season. So it is strange that they brought him back. So I can only assume they're putting him through, you know, round 125 of horrendous suffering <laughs> simply yeah, to make him more sympathetic um, yeah. so so that we've actually got some kind of emotional hook into this guy so we're not just put off from from the very beginning mm. and i guess that's probably going to be the pattern certainly the way they've set this up and again with the um i mean the, for those of you who don't know the background storyline is this is all set in a transition period between the election and the inauguration so we've got this new incoming president and she's a bit of a peacenik, I guess you might say. Mm. But it's revealed quite soon on that her reasons for being a peacenik are entirely personal. Her son died in the Iraq war. Her son was a soldier in the American army and was killed in Iraq. And Dara Dahl says this thing about he's convinced that, oh, she's going to hold us all accountable for that. And she wants <laughs> like she wants revenge against us or whatever for that. So this isn't about some deeply held political principle. This isn't about some well-founded observation about the complete failure of the war on terror. It's just that she's traumatized by her dead son. So there again, they're hinting that this series is very much going to be about emotions rather than, uh, like I say, more profound things or more intellectually based things. Mm. The way that everything's set up, it feels like that. Yeah. Mm. Well, with that being said, there is there there is quite a bit there is very uh, I don't know specific politics going on in this episode, or, or at least they're setting up for some very interesting things. And of course, um, you know, we had been speculating uh, both on both of our shows together in private that oh, it kind of sucks that that Hillary Clinton didn't win because obviously Homeland was sort of crafting this season around a junior a female junior senator from New York who becomes elected president. uh, And it's about her transition. You know, it's about the, I think it's eight weeks until inauguration. Um, So they're, you know, they're they're kind of going through all of that. Um, And I kind of wanted to get your take on this because um, they, they start pretty early on in the, in this episode with the CIA's geopolitics. um, When Saul and Dara Dahl go to, uh, um, I guess, uh, brief the president. Uh, and, you know, they're very upfront about, well, it's not about, you know, defighting. It's not about uh, defeating ISIS. It's about controlling the region and blah, blah, blah. And we get, obviously, Dar is, is much more the kind of, um, uh, I guess, sort of old school CIA type uh, character. You know, he he's basically just telling the president, this is the agenda. 
and this is how you're going to fit into that agenda. Whereas yeah. Saul is a bit more like, again, Saul, like, get your shit together. Um, you know, it's like, I, I don't understand why he's with the CIA, you know? And again, this is, I think, nature of the TV show, because they bounce back and forth so much between characters. But, you know, we had a Saul who leaves the CIA, who comes back and gets tortured by the, what is it, Al-Qaeda, Taliban uh, faction. Mm-hmm. Then in the last season, he is like Mr. CIA, you know, hardcore you know, fuck them all. We're going to, you know, uh, he, he's going to do anything. He's willing to do anything. He makes his sort of deal with the devil with Dara doll. Um, and now we're back to Saul kind of being the, um, I hate saying it, but the sort of like cliched Jewish liberal who's, you know, but he's part of the, you know, the machine, but wants to, if possible, kind of make some minor liberal changes, you know, on the exterior. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that being said, um, what did you make of the president? Because as much as it's not Hillary Clinton, that's no. for, for sure. I mean, right off the bat, there's no uh, I mean, there's almost like no parallels at all other than that. She's a woman uh, and that she's <laughs> a senator in New York. This is not Hillary Clinton. As you were saying, she's a bit of a peacenik. She thinks that not, you know, everything in the Middle East is, is A, is America's job to fix, and B, requires a military solution, which, of course, Dar gets uh, very, um, you know, peeved about. Um, but at the same time, I, I, you know, I almost saw shades of like a Trump-esque type um, character there in that, the fear amongst Dar and this sort of secret cabal that begins to form um, at the end of the episode, which is Dara Dahl, uh, some right-wing general, uh, and some right-winger um, senators, uh, and, and some other people. Saul is absent. They sort of form this secret cabal in order to God only knows what. But they have this fear that, oh, well, the new president is going to dismantle the CIA, which have already seen floated – in the mainstream media and in the alternative media, that that's what Donald Trump is going to do. So, Tom, what was your take on the president? Uh, yeah, you're right. It's a curious amalgamation that they've got there, in as much as they've got someone who superficially people are going to identify as Hillary Clinton, but her policies, they're kind of all over the map as well, just like yeah. Trump's are. Um, but she kind of echoes some of the things Trump has said about Syria and about Iraq and about foreign policy and about how maybe that's, you know, a busted flush. It's just not going to work. It's not working. Therefore, mm. turn it around. But yet Trump's domestic counterterrorism policy is very much fuck the Muslims, put them on a database, <laughs> lock them up, yeah. build a wall. It's total security state. So mm. it's total security state domestically, but much less security state abroad is the broad pattern of the various random things that Donald Trump has said. Whereas this, at least this character, is somewhat consistent in that she also seems to believe that domestically the threat is massively exaggerated, that there isn't really an enormous problem that needs countering with all of this horrendous surveillance and monitoring and interdiction by the FBI and so on. And so, yeah, she's not quite Donald Trump, She's only a little bit Hillary Clinton and only in a superficial way. They've genuinely built a character who doesn't really fall into either category. Mm. And I think they've done that cleverly. That was a good Mm -hmm. decision because if they tried to ape either candidate, they would have been screwed if they'd lost. Yes. This this way, they can talk about all of the same things that would have been on the agenda anyway, regardless of who had won, and can play with it in a at least moderately interesting and intellectually engaging way. I mean, you've got to remember, this is a TV drama. Mm. Um, and in as much as Homeland, ironically enough, actually probably contains a more in-depth and varied and intellectually stimulating critique and discussion of the war on terror than any news coverage, and I count everything across the whole spectrum in that, um, <laughs> nonetheless, we could have a much more intelligent conversation than they're having about it. Um, so, yeah, it's... I think it's a well-constructed character. They've, they've left themselves a lot of potential there. Yeah. And, yeah, this whole thing at the end where Dara Dahl is sort of, you know, off with his seven days in May coup plotters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> behind, very much behind closed doors in mm. some secret Georgetown club 
which is, mm. of course, where Homeland is written. But, um, yeah, they're, once again, also, they're embracing, they're embracing the conspiracy theories. Yes. And this is something that, um, this is something that not just for the sake of, you know, pop culture embracing conspiracy theories, but the way this whole thing has worked. I, I stumbled recently across a, a show. I, I n- never realized this got broadcast, but last November, shortly before the election, the BBC put out an episode of their conspiracy files show, which is generally terrible. Occasionally, <laughs> some of their episodes aren't so terrible, but most of them are. And it's just, you know, conspiracy debunk, conspiracy debunk. And their show was all about, it was, it's called the Donald Trump dossier. Now, it has nothing to do with this <laughs> dossier that's been circulating recently that everyone's, you know, lost their shit over. Um, it's all about Trump's use of conspiracy theories and what have mm. you in order to propagate himself as a candidate. And it's so funny to see all of that come home to roost, not just for Trump, but now it's <clears> kind of screwed Trump up, but also for the hypocrisy of all of these people who before the election were saying, oh, no, no, there's no possibility of the, the election being rigged. There's nothing wrong with, you know, there's no, there's no kind of, collaborative or, or conspiratorial effort to keep Donald Trump out of the White House. That's all just <laughs> yeah, paranoid yeah. conspiracy theories. Yeah. And as soon as he gets elected, it's like, right, we're right in there with the paranoid conspiracy yep. theories. He's the a Russian Turian yeah. candidate. He's all of <laughs> yeah. this stuff that, you know, three months ago, they never would have discussed. They would never would have dreamed of accusing a politician of this stuff. Mm. So for the hypocrisy on both sides and for the sheer drama of it, I'm kind of enjoying watching this play out. And it is interesting to see how much of that is <clears throat> right off the bat is being built into this new Homeland series. You know what, you know what's kind of, uh, striking me and again in a very freaky sort of a way, but this episode ends and obviously they're setting up for, there is going to be, there is some conspiracy against the president. Um, we, we see Dara Dahl meeting with um, a Mossad agent uh, out somewhere in lower Manhattan um, even hinted at that, that maybe they had had a, a thing back in the day, um, which I love the idea of, of that. Um, and, uh, you know, and they, I mean, what Dar uh, says a few things, he says, you know, um, uh, he says something to the effect of like, we've got to like move up operations or we've got to, we've got to finish this stuff before she gets in there. What is it? What is, it? is that like a false flag event? You know, is that something we know that Dara Dahl is willing to make a deal with uh, who? Hakani in uh, one of the seasons. Well, the arch just about anyone. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so we, and then it ends with this secretive group plotting something. And then what do we have being mirrored like every day by Donald Trump? There's a there's a conspiracy against me. The CIA is plotting to uh, to overthrow me, to use these fake um, dossiers and, and whatnot to discredit me. So and again, it's like that eerie quality where, I mean, how are how is Homeland getting that so, you know, dead on? Uh, and it makes me wonder too. All of this crap from Alex Gansa, the creator, when he you know he writes a lot of the episodes, he's a showrunner. You know, him say, oh yeah, we were you know we were so stressed out when we knew that Hillary wasn't going to win, and oh my god, but you know we just had to kind of you know, uh, power through it. And it's like, well, no shit. You had to power through it. You'd already done the, sh- the, su- the show, you know, you weren't going back and, and rewriting episodes. So the, the show was done, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, it was too late for that. Yeah. yeah. So, which made no sense. But I mean, I wonder if that was even true, you know, because there's no way they wrote this president character thinking this is going to be perfect for Hillary Clinton. You know, this is no. going to mirror everything about her. No, because she doesn't at all. Right. Now that I think brings us to um, something that's you know we always try to look at with Homeland. Uh, you just mentioned before Tom uh, about this this writers meeting um, or creators meeting, I guess, where the producers, um, the writers, uh, showrunners for Homeland, as well as the actors and I think some other crew members as well, they meet um, privately at a Georgetown club with a whole cast of characters, um, CIA operatives, both uh, current and former, State Department officials, policy wonks, all sorts of uh, people, generals, I assume. And they, they, they have these long, you know, discussions. I think it's over the course of several days. And that's how they base the next season of Homeland. So what, what do you think? I know it's hard to predict because we've only got one episode and some of the trailers for the rest of the season, but 
I have some ideas as to what we're seeing here, but what do you think we're seeing uh, in terms of what the CIA is trying to put out there, you know, uh, through Homeland? And is this going to match up with what we're seeing, what we will see in real life? Because we've already kind of seen this begin to take shape, and it's only been one episode. So what do you think, Tom? Well, I think there is evidently within the show some kind of plot against the president. I don't know exactly what they're going to do, because that could... Like you say, that could play out a number of different ways. It could be some kind of big false flag event that they then use to convince her, look, the threat is real. We have to, you know, not only maintain all of our policies, but actually make them worse. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that they're actually just going to not bump her off, but, you know, find a way of getting her out of the way and getting a vice president in there. But we haven't been introduced to a vice president at all. There's no. been no mention of her transition team, really. It's just her and one other guy that was in the hotel room for a minute. So... Right. I don't know, they could do that, but they haven't set it up at all yet. Um, that's got to be going somewhere, and that one has to assume um, is something that... I mean, there again, had Hillary won the election, there would have been no falling out with the CIA, there would have been none of yeah. the tension that we have now. So all of that actually seems predicated on Trump winning the election and on the CIA not being too happy about that because of his, you know, relatively pro-Putin and pro-Russian mm. stance. Because I don't think the CIA have any problem with Trump per se. It's that. It's yeah. the Russian thing. That's what the CIA are pissed off about. They're not pissed. I mean, Trump, I mean, for God's sake, they can run rings around that man if they want right. to. That's not the issue here. The issue here is, I guess also maybe there's an element of, like, national pride or something. Um, mm. that the CIA are like, we've been running this country secretly for the last hundred years. Well, not, that's an exaggeration, but you know what I'm yeah, saying. Right. And they're looking at it and thinking, and now we've got this idiot being the mm. public representation of that. Because say what you like about Hillary Clinton, for some bizarre reason, she was a lot more respected internationally than Trump ever will <laughs> yes. be. I don't really know why, because I always saw Hillary Clinton as this vile person. I couldn't understand why anyone, you know, I can understand people voting for her in the sense of I'll vote for her, not Trump. But I can't understand people buying into Hillary Clinton as a person, no, just as no. I can't understand people buying into Trump as a person. They both just seem like pretty dreadful individuals to me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, all of this does seem built more on a, we're assuming Trump's going to win. So therefore, they've built in this CIA threat of a coup or at least some kind of shenanigans going on behind the scenes which is what we're seeing now and so presumably that's something the CIA encouraged the homeland producers to do knowing that if Trump won they'd be in this position where they're going to have to try something behind the scenes to rein him in or at least give him an excuse for changing his Russia policy mm. because let's face it Trump doesn't sincerely believe anything no. so um the idea of getting him to about face on this is not unrealistic. But how do you do that? And how do you make that permissible to his crowd? And mm. how do you give him an excuse for doing that and appearing it appearing to be the right thing to do? You've got to set something up. You've got to get some wheels in motion. You've got to create a whole media dialogue so that in six months' time he can turn around and say, no, actually, Russia really are the enemy, and it'll seem okay. So maybe that's what they're doing is it's like a little threat towards him or a mm. little sign of what's to come in terms of their plans i mean we'll have to watch more episodes and figure that out as to how all that pertains to what's really going on but something something along those lines seems mm. to be what i mean what are your predictions where are you going well i i think so tom we we talked this is like a couple of days ago we were just talking online about this but i was saying how i think that the that isis is dead basically it really just doesn't exist anymore. Even the, you know, people like, I don't know, Charles Lister and others who made their career out of talking about ISIS, uh, even they don't really seem to care so much about, uh, ISIS as a, as an entity. I mean, it just doesn't really focus, you know, it's not like a focus for them. I mean, I'll just wait as the, <laughs> by her truck just uh, no 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 I know I know slowly. what you're saying ISIS is not really on the agenda too much right now it seems to have, again it seems to be a busted flush it doesn't seem to be going anywhere right and I think that Al Qaeda will reemerge because that that's already in place I mean um, even though they've kind of, and I mean in large degree they've like ISIS did with you know we're ISIS and we're ISIL and we're 
IS, the artist formerly known as ISIS. Um, Al Qaeda just sort of switched. To, we're Al Nusra. And then Al Nusra kind of changed their name. And I can't even remember what their new name is, but even Al Nusra changed their name. Uh, but it is Al Qaeda. And I think that, that the Al Qaeda will be resurrected in some new fashion. I think, A, Ayman al Zawahiri, he's still out there. You know, nobody talks about him, but he obviously was the mastermind. You know, bin Laden had to have been a figurehead. That's why we were able to bump him off or bump somebody off and, you know, say that it was bin Laden. But Zawahiri is still there. Does nobody care about that? Um, and I mentioned, too, before to, uh, to you that, you know, we've got the conflict in Yemen sort of wrapping up. But what's going to happen? There's going to be a huge vacuum there. Are we going to start seeing more people out of Yemen or maybe back in East Africa again? It's right over there. And then this season begins with this character um, who, uh, what's his, uh, Seku? who is a young um, Muslim-American guy. I think he, he's somewhere in Africa. I want to say maybe, you know, Nigeria or Somalia. Um, um, I, I mean, think there's that, that the story is that he's supposed to have tickets to Nigeria and that his father is in Nigeria. Right, so okay, we, yeah, we are right. to assume he's Nigerian or Nigerian-American right. or whatever. I don't, I'm, yeah. I'm not in, they're not 100% clear on that, but yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, and, you know, Nigeria, Somalia, whatever, same thing, right? Yeah, they're right next to each other. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, and, and he is going around, obviously there's, you know, he's going around with his, his, his friend who's gotta be some FBI, uh, informant. Um, you know, they, he barely even, you know, tries to hide it. And they're going around all over New York and they're going to famous terrorism spots. So they mm-hmm. go to, um, uh, where's the first place they go to? The, the hotel? Um, where, yeah, where Mayor Kahana was shot by yes. um, El Sayed Nozair, mm-hmm. which I actually, I found that fascinating that they even mentioned it and the blind sheik and no and they, one they say it's the first Al Qaeda attack, which it is, in a manner of speaking. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, what was the, I mean? You know more than I do on that, Tom. That is the first like public mention of Al Qaeda, right? That that's why it's considered the first attack. That the blind sheik um, was an Al Qaeda operative to some degree. And he did orchestrate the killing of, of uh, Meir Khan. Well, sure, certainly uh, Said Nozair, this Egyptian guy, um, he was a follower of the Blind Sheik. He was one of the guys going to the Al Farouk Mosque. He was part of that whole scene that was going on there at the end of the 1980s as Operation Cyclone was kind of winding up. And this was a place that in the 80s was being used to raise money, but more specifically gather recruits to send them out to Afghanistan to join the jihad when we were all pro-jihad, when the CIA the CIA were, you know, completely involved in that. Supposedly, everyone took their eye off the ball as soon as the Soviet-Afghan war finished. And a couple of years later, you start getting this violence, violent people coming out of this mosque in various ways and doing various things. One of them is Nozair, who kills this extremely rabid and racist and nasty mm fundamentalist uh, rabbi, I guess. Yeah, yeah, um, loose definition of rabbi. <laughs> yeah. Um, and don't get me wrong, just because he's a horrible, racist, nasty cretin doesn't mean he deserves to get shot, but it's kind of he was playing with fire. So yes. sooner or later, you've got to think if you're going and saying those things in public, sooner or later, someone's probably going to have a crack at you. Um, <clears throat> and yeah. Nozair was a follower of the Blind Sheikh. He was a student of Ali Muhammad, this mysterious triple agent, quadruple <laughs> yeah. agent. I mean, who, who knows what Ali Muhammad really was and who he was really working for, but certainly has CIA, Pentagon and FBI contacts. It's the same group of people coming out of this mosque who ultimately do the World Trade Center bombing in 93. And when several months after the World Trade Center bombing, when the Blind Sheikh is finally arrested, and basically everyone at this mosque is arrested, apart from Ramzi Youssef and Ali Mohammed. Um, it's Bin Laden actually paid some money into the Blind Sheikh's defense fund. He was actually paying for part of his legal defense. So therefore, people have assumed the Blind Sheikh was some kind of nascent Al-Qaeda operative, and this whole thing mm. was, in some sense of the word, Al-Qaeda. And okay, fair enough. I can see at least some string to that. But my problem with it is... At every turn, you've got the CIA involved, because the only way the blind sheikh got into the country in the first place was on a CIA-sponsored visa. 
And when Nozair was actually there in the hotel shooting Mayor Kahana, um, <laughs> the blind sheikh was out of the country mysteriously, and his visa got revoked. But he still got back into the country and was hanging around for another, like, two and a half years before he got arrested. How does that happen? The only way that happens is if there's some intelligence agency protecting you. Meanwhile, the guy who's training all the people at this mosque, Ali Mohammed, officially joined the CIA and then left them a few months later. Yep. <laughs> but the reality is there's quite a number of sources point to he actually joined the CIA several years before that, right at the beginning of the 1980s, and was working for the CIA for that whole decade. So the idea that he then just stopped working for them and then in 1991 one of his trainees shoots someone, but no one draws any connections. Even though, even though, when the FBI raided Nozair's apartment, they found all kind of shit in there. They found mm. top secret training manuals from Fort Bragg, for heaven's sake. But where Ali, Ali Muhammad, Muhammad worked. Yeah, where Ali Muhammad worked for the Special Forces when he was training, <laughs> when he was a s supply sergeant in the Special Forces. Mm. They didn't draw any connections. They didn't figure this out. Nonsense. You know, there was some kind of pressure there stopping the FBI from breaking that whole thing apart in 1991 when Nozair did his thing. And as a consequence, they were all still there in 93 and bombed the World Trade Center. So I found it very strange that they were pointing people to this. And the guy, the guy's there. He's like, they're filming this, I don't know, documentary. What is this? What Something, are these videos yeah. even for? We're not sure. But and he's there telling people, Google this guy's name. Look yes. this stuff up. Look into yeah. this. I found that very odd because that's like speaking to the audience, saying mm -hmm. Google this stuff, look this stuff up. But as soon as people start looking into that, they're going to trip over a whole bunch of stuff that says either this was the most spectacular FBI bungle possibly in their entire history or this was some kind of covert operation. So I don't know why they'd want people looking into that. But, uh, yeah, the, Very odd. Very odd. Um, I, I actually think... Um, I think it's because one of the other plot lines in this season is going to be this FBI CIA feud. And they're going to portray the FBI as basically this, you know, um, the, the FBI is not a law enforcement uh, agency. They don't um, investigate crime. They create crime and then they quote unquote stop it. You know, mm -hmm. um, that's all the FBI does. And that's basically what's going on here. Th this character, um, who is, you know, going around and um, making this documentary, Seku, with his friend, and they have a website that's getting a lot of traffic. You know, they, they arrest him uh, later on in the episode, and they accuse him of, you know, material support of terrorism and whatnot. And obviously, I, I do think he's, he's going to be innocent, in, you know, in as much as he wasn't, he's not actually a terrorist. Um, I don't think that's where the terror threat is going to come. But maybe it will be one of those... You know, the FBI is so focused on Seku that they miss the actual terrorist, which is maybe, you know, maybe that again, like you were saying with the the killing of uh, Meyer Kahana, maybe, you know, that's the well, if only they had been paying attention to something, you know, it's a it's an intelligence failure. Um, but the other reason is, I think it is about, um, you know, it's about explaining the Al Qaeda legend to us again. You know, mm. and maybe also kind of, you know, rebranding it and sort of clarifying events. So, you know, we go all the way back to the very first Al Qaeda attack, you know, and then, and, and again, too, it, you know, anyone that's unaware, I mean, New York is like the, the epicenter of all of this stuff. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know, the Al Farouk Mosque on, on Atlantic Avenue, uh, very, very integral to the whole myth of Al Qaeda and the, the jihad in Afghanistan and all that stuff. They go, they mention Ramzi Youssef, um, and, uh, WTC 93. Um, they go to, uh, where is it? Um, in, in Times Square where, uh, Faisal Shahzad, the Times Square bomber, um, oh, you know, they, they talk about him. So again, they're, they're, uh, I think they're, they're reiterating to us the Al Qaeda myth. Which I think should should strike people as odd, given that isn't Al Qaeda gone? You know, we killed Bin Laden. You know, isn't ISIS the the real threat? But I, maybe it's not. Um, so I think that's well, and, what's and they sort they sort of set that up in the whole briefing in the hotel room with the new president elect as well, mm -hmm. where Daradal sort of saying, "Oh no, there's Saul who says, you know, the problem isn't getting rid of ISIS. You know, yeah. we can massacre ISIS. The problem is that you then get a new ISIS coming in their place. So they're yes. kind of telling us it there as well, but." 
you know, even if we kill off ISIS, there'll be another terrorist gang waiting in the wings mysteriously that will mm. just flower up in the next year or two that will seem ever more devastating. And the truth is they probably could do that quite effectively. You remember, I can't remember when this was, but for about two or three weeks there, they were talking about some like new branch of ISIS called, I want to say Coruscant, but that's yeah, yeah, Coruscant Star Wars, Wars, but it was something like that. It Coruscant, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they, you know, everyone was losing their minds over this and saying, oh, my God, you know, look, they're, yeah. they're like they're, they're like that ISIS on crack or whatever. <laughs> everyone completely forgot about it. No one ever mentioned them pretty much ever again, as far as I'm aware. I mean, you you and Christoph follow this a bit more closely than me, but they've they've not really come back into the story, have they? No, no, no. They, they, if they even exist. Yeah, if they ever <laughs> no, exist. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not being facetious. I mean, do they even really exist? Was it just like two guys on a hilltop in exactly. Syria somewhere yeah. and the CIA decided to call them a terrorist gang for a couple of weeks? I mean, hmm. it really is that ridiculous at this point that it wouldn't surprise you if they did do that. Al-Shabaab is another one. No one cares about Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab were like the big thing in 2013 before ISIS took over. Everyone was going crazy about Al-Shabaab, Al-Shabaab, Al-Shabaab. No one really seems to care about Al-Shabaab anymore. I can't remember the last time I saw them in the news. So... Hmm. The growth and decline of, of in, in international Islamist terror gangs is, is a pretty high turnover. It's approximately the same kind of turnover as you get with, like, X-Factor contestants. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and just as unbelievable and just mm. as staged, <laughs> I would argue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think you're probably onto something there. And also I wonder, with the ones that they're looking at, with the particular cases, they had Faisal, Faisal Shazad, they had WTC93 they mentioned, and they mentioned Sayed Nozair. All of them were kind of very small scale, relatively the so-called self-radicalizers. I mean, they weren't quite, but it's not like they were part of some huge international globalized jihadi network. So I wonder if they're not um, just trying to pump a bit more of that in that, you know, you don't have to be part of a gang. There doesn't even need to be a gang. Yeah. You can still just have lots of terrorists. Yeah. They're all over the place. They could just be in a, you know, next time you go to hear someone speak in a hotel room, they might get shot by a Muslim. And that's apparently mm. terrorism, regardless of circumstance or context or anything. That's terrorism. So I think they were also just selling that idea of, you know, just this completely decentralized, dispersed terrorist threat, which has always been... I mean, there's only so long you can pump that for before you have to then create a new terrorist gang that you name and say, this is the focus. But that's always been kind of bubbling away in the background is this notion that it doesn't really matter whether they're part of a gang or not. And I would argue, if you're not part of a terrorist gang, are you really a terrorist? Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, what, exactly. One nutter shooting a bunch of people at a supermarket is more insanity than terrorism. Mm. Um, so, you know, you know what, I, I, I just got the, I mentioned before on the show, I, I got the a new book, uh, Aberration in the Heartland of the Real, which is all about Timothy McVeigh. Um, you know, and it's, well, if Timothy McVeigh was a lone wolf, is that really terrorism or is that just mass murder? Mm. You know, I mean, you know, cause they, they, they want to cut that both ways. You know, he was a lone wolf, but part of this radical white supremacist, you know, organization that had no, oh, no connections to the military militia or whatever. Yeah. 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 You know, but then it's like, why well, is it terrorism if he was a lone wolf? You, you know, I mean, uh, you, no, I, I, I think that's a, that's a great point you just made there. I just pulled this up, too. Um, a couple of days ago on Long War Journal, U.S. kills three AQAP operatives in a pair of strikes in Yemen. I mean, oh, they're bringing a, back AQAP. Yeah, exactly. So, all right, apparently al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is still around and is important enough that the U.S. is launching strikes, and again, in Yemen. Remember that country mm -hmm. we used to be so obsessed with, and then it... We basically let Saudi Arabia, Arabia, all of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now it's just basically we allowed Saudi Arabia to commit almost, you know, tantamount to a genocide in this country. And not, but not far now, off. Yeah. yeah. And now suddenly AQAP is back. Oh, you know, that's that's going to be important. So, yeah, it it's fascinating, again, the way that Homeland is, um, you know, mirroring stuff that we were talking about like a week ago. Um, well, and I guess there again, we can divide it into the domestic and the foreign. The foreign agenda will be probably Al Qaeda franchise groups like AQAP. And, yeah. You know, yeah, I think, I think Al, this Al Qaeda in the Islamic with Russia Maghreb. And, you isn't going to be over. No, I think no. it's going to be a factor, but you, 
there's we're not going to be fighting the Russians. And at some point, the CIA has got to, um, you know, they've got to get on with it, too. You know, and I think in a similar way, like with the president in Homeland, if a bomb goes off in New York City, you know, God forbid, knock on wood. But mm. if that happens under Trump, he will do whatever the CIA asks of him. You know, I, I mean, so. he is yeah. that much of a turd. He's not, you know, he's no backbone, you know? I mean, just imagine that they blow it up near his hotel. Where did they blow up his hotel, you know? <laughs> um, well, they blow up do- the lobby of Trump Tower. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He will do whatever the fuck they put in front of him. And I think, and again, yeah. too, what better way to attack the Russians than through Islamic terrorists, you know? Well, and let's also knock on wood and say that if they are going to blow up somewhere in New York, that it is Trump Tower, because they've <laughs> yeah, probably yeah, never, know, been, never be been a more deserving target. And frankly, <laughs> any, anywhere else, you're likely to kill someone innocent, whereas um, <laughs> there, you could at least make a fringe of an argument <laughs> for it being a legitimate target. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just to finish what I was saying, that, you know, maybe that's the narrative that we're looking at going forward, not just based on this Homeland episode, but based on, you know, the current political climate, and we're trying to extrapolate a bit. Is that yes. in terms of the foreign policy, it will continue to be justified by the so-called Al Qaeda franchise groups. Domestically, it will probably just be this completely dispersed, random, decentralized, vague terrorist threat that could be anywhere and everywhere, and it isn't even, you know, organized into a gang or a network. It's just random people here, there, and everywhere. And you're so right about this this character's friend who's following him around, who's constantly asking him oh questions, like, like an FBI informant might. Yeah, <laughs> mysteriously oh, yeah. does. Doesn't end up getting arrested. He's there helping yeah, him do stuff, help, yeah. helping do the website. We never see him get arrested. His, mm. his mother and his sister, they get, you know, harassed and kind of a bit beaten up by the, you know, FBI SWAT team or whatever. We never get to see the buddy. No. So we can only assume he's an informant from what we've seen so far. And there again, is that what they're, they're also doing is to some extent normalizing that and saying, because it's so decentralized, because it's so, you know, random lone wolves and what have you, we have to have all of these FBI informants. It's not something suspicious when you find out there was an FBI informant attached to this so-called terrorist plot. It's actually just a necessary consequence of the nature of the terrorist threat. Maybe that's what they're trying to sell us. Because they have had a fair bit of criticism, even in, you know, pretty major press recently, have picked up on this notion that, Hang on, are the FBI setting up like nine tenths of these so called yeah. terrorists? That's like minority seem- report. Yeah, yeah. It's getting to that point where people are actually starting to twig this that hang on, the chances of there being that proportion of FBI informants, that means it's a policy. That doesn't mean it's you know, the FBI yes. are really good at stopping terrorists. That means they've got a policy in place of entrapping people. Mm. People are you know, the public is starting to twig this, so Maybe they're trying to counter that a little bit. Um, there's a lot of different, you know, there's a lot of different spinning plates here, and I really don't know quite what we are mm. to make of it at this point. But certainly it's going to be fascinating watching all of this play out. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and it just it just occurred to me as you were talking there, too, It's there's like almost a sort of like double think going on with, if, if this season does have, a, and I think it will play out, some sort of feud, um, between the CIA and the FBI. Obviously, the CIA is going to be represented by Kerry, um, who obviously is going to get pulled back in in some capacity. Um, but she is the CIA. You know, that's that's our character. That's us, uh, you know, in the CIA. And she's obviously going to be feuding with this dickhead FBI agent who knows clear well that, you know, there's there's nothing here, you know. Um, I, I mean, yeah, when they say, well, he has a plane ticket to Nigeria, it's like, d- doesn't the mother also have a plane ticket and the daughter? They're all going back there. <laughs> like, doesn't, yeah, doesn't he no have shit. a family in Nigeria? Yeah, I know. And then it's like 5000 in cash. It's like, it. I, I mean, again, uh, is that suspicious? I guess so. I mean, is is having cash dangerous? You know, I mean, it's all like well, and f- five grand. I mean, OK, that's a lump of money, but it's not like a massive. No, you're money. not buying There are reasons why bomb. someone, he might have sold a car, you know, for five grand. Right. I, there are reasons why someone might have five grand in cash. That's not going to finance a massive terrorist attack, is it? Mm. So, oh, no, no. I mean, excuse me. He is an, he is an immigrant in the United States. He doesn't send money back home? Yeah. Is, is, like, is that illegal? <laughs> no, I know what you mean. Like, there's, yeah. there's a thousand different explanations yeah. for why that, you know, could be not suspicious. And only really one for why it would be suspicious. So yeah, I do think they're kind of setting up that FBI guy to be a typical FBI prick, you know. But I think the, it's 
he's got the usual sort of tight ass oh, patronizing yeah, yeah, attitude right. that FBI has. But to be honest, FBI agents do actually have in reality. So they've, yes. they've kind of got it right. So, oh, uh, yeah, 100%. But I think it's almost funny because, you know, at the same time, I, you know, I'll be curious to see if, 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 if the message of this season isn't that these terrorists are everywhere. You know, maybe the FBI sets up some people wrong, but hey, you know, they are around every corner. They just have to get better at setting them up. So again, that weird double think where, yeah, they're feuding, but ultimately, you know, I mean, it's not, I mean, I, I assume at this point the CIA has control over at least vast swaths of the FBI, if not the entire. I mean, at least the, the FBI knows who runs the show. At this point. Oh yeah, they they know that they're the junior agency. Yes. To to the CIA and NSA, mm. those two are at the top of American intelligence, and everyone else gets shafted. Basically, yeah. <laughs> um, right. if the NSA and the CIA don't want to tell the FBI something, the FBI do not find them. out. Yeah. Right. They don't know. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I don't know. It, it's kind of. I think it'll be interesting to see how that kind of evolves, and you know, will. Although the show has made a habit of of beating up on the FBI. Um, from time to time, which is always funny. Um, a, a couple little quick things um, uh, that I wanted to just kind of cover. What do you make of the? I do think that you know the other thing w- when I was talking to you about, and I mentioned this on an episode, flash po- places that are going to be important. I said Israel and Palestine, and then of course in this episode we've got the Mossad uh, getting very nervous um, about uh, you know what's going on just the other day. Uh, there was a report I saw on Intel News um, uh, where it was reported in Ynet uh, that um, the Isra- Israeli and U.S. intelligence officials had a big meeting and the U.S. warned Israel not to share intelligence with Trump, that it would either be leaked to the Russians or the Iranians. Uh, we know that this season is also going to be talking about the Iran deal. Um, any any kind of thoughts on that? It seemed like we've got the, the Mossad uh, chief, uh, from last season, he he appears again, or he's in the trailer at least. Any any kind of thoughts on that at all? You mean Saul's buddy from yes. last season, yes. the one who does a favor or two for it? Yes. Um, I mean, my only real thought is that, given how much of this has evidently been uh, filmed in New York and is set in New York, that in as much as they are going to incorporate a foreign element, it would appear that's where they're going with it. Um. The other thing that strikes me as odd is this whole conversation they had about Syria in the, in the hotel room, in the briefing, is more or less the same conversation they had at the start of last season. You remember yes. when, when they call Quinn into that basement at Langley or whatever it is. Right. Sitting there saying that, you know, there's two options, basically. We either, you know, um, we, what does he, he say? He says we can either pound Raqqa into a parking lot yes. or we can send in like 150,000 troops and 150,000 teachers and doctors. <laughs> um, yeah. They seem to have knocked it down now to 70,000. It mm-hmm. seems that IS- ISIS has been blown up <laughs> yeah, enough yeah, by yeah, Russia yeah. that now it'll right. only take 70,000 to finish them off. And I'm thinking 70,000? That's still quite a lot. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's still an invasion, whichever way yes. you dice it up. So... That I just found odd, but I suppose reflective of the fact that a year on from the last season, we still don't really seem to have a policy in Syria. I no. mean, for real. No no one seems to really understand what's the end game here and how are we going to accomplish that? We just sort of rebound week to week from, oh, you know, now ISIS has done this. Oh, now Russia have beaten them back there. Oh, now we've got to be triumphant because we've sort of beaten ISIS over here. But the problem is Assad <laughs> is beating them there and Assad is still evil. So yes. and we're still <laughs> sort of supposed to be opposed to Assad, maybe. Does anyone even know or care anymore? It's The whole situation is so confused that I guess that's why it was reflected in, in the fact that we don't seem to have got anywhere in a whole season of Homeland. The policy doesn't seem to have got any better. It's because it hasn't in reality. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, maybe that's where they're going with the whole Israel-Palestine. And they did throw in Iran in there as well. Yeah. You know, there is, I think it's Dara Dahl mentions this thing about refocusing on Iran. And I'm wondering. Yeah. Why? Iran I know, has... especially given the Iran deal. Yeah. Uh, so I mean. Where are they going yeah. with that? In as much as this show is going to have a foreign policy element or foreign locations even at least settings. They probably didn't actually film in Palestine, obviously. <laughs> no, I doubt uh, it. <laughs> would they even get permission? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but 
you know what I mean, in as much as they're going to set any of the show abroad, I can only guess they're going back to Israel, Palestine, maybe with a touch of Iran as well. And we're not, they're probably not going to talk that much about Syria going forward because there isn't much more to say. Um, hmm. There no, is no and, and, policy and, in Syria, so there's nothing for them to really be commenting on or playing on, as I hmm. see it. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I mean, you know, I am just talking off the top of my head after watching one episode. So. <laughs> right. No, no, of course. Yes, obviously, who knows where um, where we're going with this. But, uh, no, it, it also is troubling uh, that, you know, a focus on Iran in this season, given uh, that – so as given also that Donald Trump is, uh, you know, going to rip up the Iran deal. It's like, uh, Really? You know, we just the, the one just, good thing to yeah. come out of the Obama presidency. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and it, and it's it's like only because he didn't come up with it. You know, <laughs> like you know, Obama did one good deal. You know, that's that's terrible. Uh, and just a, a quick thing: the Mossad agent who appears in Homeland, uh, Tova, is also was a main character on um uh, or in many episodes of Prisoners of War, which is the Israeli, uh, just the original version of Homeland, the Israeli oh, version. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so the that's a, Raphael yeah. version. Yeah. Um, so you know, interesting little. I don't know. You know, maybe the, we're we're tying it all back. You know, um, to to the original series, which is we should watch that series at some point. Uh, and do should, something yes. on it. Um, because um, it would be interesting to see where where they go with that, and 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 who knows what little things happen in that show that ha- were happening in real life. Um. Yeah. That would be kind of freaky. Um, any any other kind of uh, uh, final thoughts or, or things you wanted to get out of the way? Um, I'll, you know, I'll quickly mention that, um, you know, uh, this, this like whole season seems to take place uh, literally in my neighborhood, um, you know, from Quinn's crack house to Carrie's house to um, <laughs> the housing projects that Sadu lives in is like all like within walking distance of where I live, um, which is like so weird and you know, a bit strange, although um, people may vaguely remember there was a shooting in bed here uh, like a year or two ago, um, uh, very close to where a train station by my house. Uh, and it was this guy who was like crazy and the cops killed him in like that. He was like running down the tracks or something. But that was in the midst of this weird anti-terrorism drill that just happened to be taking place in bed that day. Um, so, you know, that's always an odd thing. But um, any any uh, any little things um, uh, that you wanted to throw in, Tom? Uh, well, just to reiterate, because I know we've only got a minute before the music's going to come up. But, um, yeah, what I said at the beginning, in terms of a piece of entertainment, I think Homeland is kind of shot. I think we've seen their box of tricks. We've seen what these producers yeah. can come up with, and there's probably not going to be many surprises on that score. Politically, I'm fascinated to see where they're going to go with this, because they have set up a lot of moving parts, a lot of spinning plates in this first episode. I wish they'd left the arrest of the the, the young Nigerian Muslim guy. I wish they'd left that later, because I was kind of interested in what he was doing. And they Me might too. have Me too. set him up a bit more before they actually, you know, pulled the, whatever, slung him in prison. Mm. Um, so, yeah. I Certainly we should pick up on this mid-season, and see where they've gone in another five or six episodes, because I'm sure there's going to be both real news and interesting stuff on <laughs> Homeland that is going to be intertwining in the next five or six weeks. So mm. it's very much a it's a watch this space. I don't mm. know quite where they're going to go with this, but as always, I'm, I'm very interested to see. This is still one of the most provocative and interesting TV series out there, even if it's not that good as a piece of entertainment anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, and maybe, maybe it'll, maybe it'll, it'll get better. It, it almost seems a bit like the characters, like, don't really matter so much. Um, you know, it's sort of like, who really cares what Carrie is doing? Like, okay, now she, she's back to being a do-gooder. Um, great. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, that is the music. So, um, thank you, Tom, for joining us in the first hour. Robbie Martin will be joining us in the second hour for an interesting discussion on geopolitics. So, uh, s- uh stick with us and, uh, we'll be back very soon.
I like very much radio. You're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. Are you feeling embarrassed and stuck because you can't focus or concentrate? I have a confession to make. I spent years unable to think clearly like I was in a fog. I was going through the motions, running my companies, and I hated feeling groggy and mentally sluggish. I couldn't get ahead like this. It's no secret the powers that be want us dumbed down. Chemicals, fluoride, our brains are under siege and we are experiencing lower IQs. But now there's a weapon to fight back and win. Introducing DNA Evolve, a revolutionary breakthrough in a category of cognitive enhancers called nootropics. I've been using DNA Evolve and couldn't feel better. For me, it works. It feels great to get things done again and get ahead. Try a free sample for yourself at DNAEvolveSample.com. That's DNAEvolveSample.com. Supplies are limited, so go to DNAEvolveSample.com right now. Did you know there are 3 million edible food plants on Earth and none have the nutritional value of the hemp plant? HempUSA.org offers you hemp protein powder. It does not contain chemicals or THC, is non-GMO, and is 100% gluten-free. Hemp protein powder burns fat, builds muscle, contains 53% protein, and feeds the body the nutrients it needs. Call 888-910-4367 and see what our powder, seeds, and oil can do for you only at HempUSA.org. HempUSA.org introduces three brand new detox formulations of micro plant powder. Brain Fuel for depression, bipolar disorders, and stress. Total Care, anti-cancer agent that cleans the liver and organs and increases memory. Rejuvenate, invigorates and heals the body, mind, and spirit. These products are your alternative to pharmaceuticals. Call 888-910-4367 and like us on Facebook. We ship worldwide only at HempUSA.org. We all know that they're not telling us the truth. So stand up for your rights, demand the real medicine, and your right to use it and grow it. This is Rick Sensen, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. What about show business? Show business, completely dishonest, corrupt, and full of shit, but in a nice way. (laughs) Plenty of expensive drugs and perverted sex. You're going to be full of shit. Might as well enjoy your work. Then you have the media, not just the news media, let's include them all. The media are almost literally exploding with bullshit because they're located right at the crossroads of all the other bullshit. The media are made up of equal parts, advertising, politics, business, public relations, and show business. These people are sitting right at bullshit junction. There's enough bullshit in the media for Texas to open a branch office. And you still have enough left over to start two law firms and a Christian bookstore. What has American Freedom Radio ever done for us? Provide us for free education? Well, that's obviously effective. But apart from reversing the dumbing down of America... All the information they provide is free? What about the free podium for broadcast activists to speak from, man? Eh? Uh, exploiting uh, commonplace corruption? They help uh, vulnerable people who don't have a voice? I'll uh, bring in light to uh, important information nobody else does. Or oh, they never censor, hang up, or cut off their guests? Well, that's no fun, is it? Well, they created a fantastic alternative media source during an era of bad, manipulative, and infiltrated mainstream and alternative media shows and scum. Okay, well, apart from the free education, free information, free podium for broadcast activists to speak from, exposing commonplace corruption, helping vulnerable people without a voice, bringing light to important information nobody else does, and creating a fantastic commercial-free alternative media source in a sea of bad, manipulative mainstream and alternative media shows and scum, what has American Freedom Radio ever done for us? Donate to American Freedom Radio today. No rules. No rules. No taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything. Geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to 
play a lot of New York City. Your host, Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the second hour of Parkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redman. If uh, you're just joining us right now, uh, in the first hour, we spoke with our good friend Tom Secker all about the new season of Homeland. But joining us right now is a, a good friend and frequent guest on the show, Robbie Martin. Robbie, how are you? Great, man. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Excellent. And, uh, and of course, um, everybody uh, should already know, but if you don't, Robbie is, of course, the filmmaker behind A Very Heavy Agenda. He is a co-host on Media Roots Radio. And, uh, and Robbie, where can people go to find all your work? Um, probably a very heavy agenda dot com would be the best place, um, or they can follow my Twitter at, at fluorescent gray. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, Robbie, I wanted to um, have you on to talk, uh, maybe talk some some geopolitics. Um, there's like, you know, it's funny. I was talking with um, a friend of mine at work was saying how excited I, I, I or thought I would be really excited about Trump being president because I'll never have to worry about a topic for the radio show because there's, like, always something um, to talk about when it comes to him. And, Robbie, I don't think we've spoken since um, the election per se. So um, how are you uh, – and, and I think probably the last time we spoke was our Pizzagate episode. So um, I don't know. How are you feeling since then? Oh, things are just – Really, really weird. I mean, um, <laughs> it seems like there are several propaganda campaigns happening simultaneously. Um, this whole idea of fake news, it's kind of almost a weaponized term, has become really popular um, in the wake of the election, um, which seems to be creating bad effects on both sides of the spectrum. So the people skeptical of the mainstream media are now, are now calling everything that they disagree with fake news and people in the mainstream media are calling alternative media fake news. So mm-hmm. it's like, it has, um, you know, negative effects on both sides. It just seems to be making people less critical thinkers. Um, and so that, I mean, that's been something that's been really bothering me, I guess, since the election. And then just this whole idea that Trump is going to use that to his advantage. So whoever launched that talking point of fake news, um, you know, Trump is going to use it to his advantage and, and use the media as constantly as his foil and just say that anything he disagrees with is fake news. Um, and we pretty much already saw that happen. Even though that document, um, I don't know what the Russian word is, a compocrat or something like that? Yeah, you know, something pronounce- to that effect. <laughs> Um, that, that document itself actually seems like bullshit to me, but even still, seeing Trump's reaction at the press conference was interesting because it was sort of something I was expecting to play out, but I didn't know it would quite play out on that level, where he didn't answer BuzzFeed and CNN's questions. Um, mm. So I, I, things are just really weird, man. I mean, the, it's, <laughs> I mean, people use this phrase post-truth, and I think it's kind of a dumb phrase, but it, it <laughs> applies pretty well to what's happening right now. I mean, I can't deny that it actually does seem to, I mean, it, it's, it, we're moving into a new era of information absorption, I guess. Um, and as someone who put out my own piece of fake news back in 2004 in the form of a fake beheading video, it's something that I kind of expected to happen eventually, but not quite like this. Um mm. But I, totally I think it also, forgot about that. <laughs> I, I think it also signals a. I mean, it's an, another, let's say, another nail in the coffin for the mainstream media. They're obviously using that term "fake news" as a means to differentiate what they're doing from, you know, lower down media, alternative media, and stuff like that. So, I don't know, man. It's mm. it's been really weird. No, I, it, it does. It it doesn't seem real. It doesn't seem like it's happening. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's, it's, you know, he, he's not even the president yet, technically. Uh, and it's already been this shit show to end all shit shows. Uh, you know, I can't even really, I can't fathom. Someone, someone asked me recently, like, well, what do you think it's going to be like when he's actually in office? I have no idea, really. I, I can't truly picture it in my head, which is really kind of, uh, scary, 
Um, on the on the the topic of, of, of fake news and um, you know pissgate and stuff, I do think you know for the record, I think that dossier is BS. Um, I the whole story with this MI6 operative steal and he's like on the run, but the what the Daily Mail knew where he was. Um, it seems like and that this was floating around for like months and mo- or maybe even a year prior. Um, oh, yeah. That makes no sense. The idea that Trump is like a Manchurian candidate that Putin uh, tapped like three or four years ago, that like in 2013, Putin knew this guy is going to be the president or is going to run for president. That seems a bit far fetched. Uh, and it does seem like if anything, it's just a partly a distractionary um, operation, but partly just to ramp up the tension and divide and conquer in the American public between you either are with Russia or you're with us. That's which, sort of, no, I agree ahead, with Bobby. that. I, I mean, it, which is a really, really bad precedent to set to fight against Trump, because basically what that is, is it's a form of nationalism that we're dipping back into the past I mean, it's it's a form of it's a it is a form of nationalism and and jingoism that's being used against Trump's version of nationalism, which yeah. it it just seems like if you're really interested in taking down Trump and damaging him, going at him from this idea that he's a Russian Manchurian candidate is by far the worst strategy to do that with, because it is it's basically tapping into the same thing that he's tapping into paranoia. Jingoism, nationalism, um, you know, make America great again. I mean, that harkens back to the 1950s, and so does McCarthyism and fear, you know, Red Scare fear. So it, it's very odd to me that the Democrats and the mainstream media are using that angle so heavily, because actually I would argue that before that angle really came to, into fruition, that he's some kind of Putin agent, um, they were attacking him with better things the media was doing the mainstream media was doing a better job of attacking him finding clips of him saying things you know creepy yeah. things about his daughter i mean <laughs> that might not cause damage to him necessarily but that's to me that's a that's a much better journalism than what's happening now now it's just some kind of paranoid torrent flood of paranoia that i i just don't see how we can roll it back and that's that scares me yeah no i know what you mean and and it um, you know, I, I know that apparently there's nothing in, in Trump's, uh, tax returns, but that seems like a more realistic, you really want to attack him, get that. There, I mean, I'm, there, I'm sure the CIA could get access. They, they already have his tax returns, you know? Um, of course. Why not release that? I mean, that, because, and, and that seems to, um, get Trump a lot more riled up than the the Russia stuff, you know? The Russia stuff, now, I mean, the whole Golden Showers thing, um, Pissgate, uh, maybe that, that, that riles him up. I mean, it does, I think, on some level. But the questioning of the tax returns is, I think, a big, he got more pissed off at that press conference about the tax returns, you yeah. know? And he acted really kind of, you know, in this, like, little kid snotty, like, mimicking, oh, yeah, you know, I know you think it's, it's a big deal, but it's not. Uh, to a reporter, and, you know, it is like, what's in your tax returns, Donald? You know, I, I mean, it, it, don't keep hiding behind this IRS audit. Um, you know, what what are you afraid of of, of, of seeing there? Um, so, you know, I think that that's kind of fascinating to me. Um, and, of course, it's so funny that BuzzFeed is taking the lead in all of this. And, oh, yeah. Um, and, again, you know, uh, you out front with all of this, you know, several years before BuzzFeed was sort of uh, the, the the kind of, I don't know, like, go-to household propaganda thing. But, it, of course, it has to be BuzzFeed because they're, they're the most anti-Russian, sort of pro-NATO, um, you know, kind of CIA-friendly news outlet. Um, and it's funny that nobody's even pointing to that. You know, they're pointing to BuzzFeed as just being stupid, you know, fake news. Not BuzzFeed has this long-running history of... Uh, basically being a mouthpiece for American uh, imperialism, particularly anti-Russian rhetoric. No, and I, I mean, I almost, I almost come off as being a little nutty and paranoid myself when I try to explain <laughs> to people that BuzzFeed was front and center 
on pushing this anti-Russian propaganda years ago. I mean, they yeah. were, you know, besides Vice, I would say Daily Beast jumped in a little later and was a little more obviously neocon. You know, they had um, Eli Lake and Rogan and Michael Weiss and Peter Pomerantsev constantly writing stories, you know, directing fire at Russia. But BuzzFeed did it in a more insidious like millennial friendly fashion. I mean, I remember when I appeared on Abby's show back in 2014, right before all the Crimea stuff really erupted, they did a top 10 craziest moments on RT, like listicle thing. And they, <laughs> the, one of the top 10 craziest moments was my, perf, my musical performance on her show. And I remember thinking, that's so odd, you know, cause no, like hardly anybody talked about RT back then. Um, yeah. you know, it doesn't seem that long ago, but, People, most people even know, didn't even know what the channel was. So I thought it was interesting that BuzzFeed, it just struck me as like, wow, that's really fascinating that BuzzFeed would be like, look at these crazy top ten moments on a network that none of you have ever heard of before. Like, that's just yeah. a weird thing in and of itself to do. And then, you know, I realized much later, of course, that they were actually, it was like a deliberate strategy. And Miriam Elder, one of the people really friendly with the State Department who hosted a Google Hangout with John Kerry, um, who also appeared on Lawrence O'Donnell with PNAX 2.0, Jamie Kerchick. She was one of the authors of this article. Um, and I thought that was interesting. That got lost completely because BuzzFeed Ben, the, you know, the head of BuzzFeed kind of came out front and center of it. But Miriam Elder is actually one of the co-authors. So, you know, I was just like, oh, wow, there it is. You know, I mean, it's super obvious. And the fact that they were sitting on this for so long implies that on some level, journalism – or journalists in D.C. in this bubble, this community, were being fueled by this dossier months ago. So their mindset yeah. approaching their coverage of Russia, their coverage of Trump, was already being fueled by this paranoid, you know, probably completely false dossier. And that's interesting because it kind of implies that someone dropped it to them, hoping that they would, you know, it would fuel them, but not necessarily, you know, not that they would directly report it, but it was more important that it would sort of fuel their paranoia and fuel their like sort of Russian Trump angle. So I don't know. That's, mm. that's my take on it. Mm. Yeah. It, it It's funny too. You're just mentioning uh, being uh, back on Abby's show and I don't know why for the life of me in this dossier, that um that Abby is like she's like one of the main you know proponents of, of this or one of the main driving factors she's like named multiple times as being you know she wasn't even at RT when 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 Trump was you know doing his thing um so it's i mean the vendetta against your sister is like gee like let it go guys she's at a completely different network now you know uh, and, and it's and, odd, and, yeah. and it, she's not she's no friend of Trump either no, I mean, the, the whole, and, and you're talking about the ODNI report that was supposed to be the proof that Russia yes. was manipulating our election, which ended up being, you know, two thirds about Russia today's coverage from 2012 <laughs> and how, and how they were trying to manipulate the 2012 election, which is just so strange because there was a very distinct moment in the debates between Romney and Obama in 2012 where Romney was trying to say that Russia was our greatest geopolitical threat, and Obama was mocking him. So mm. if the U.S. government thought that Russia was met doing this kind of serious meddling back then, the president, on some level, was just completely not on board with that, or at least rhetorically. So that's pretty fascinating. And, and yeah, you, like you said, she left the network um, by the time, the, you know, she left the network, I think, in 2015. Um, and all the stuff they brought up in this document was – Stuff that's very popular among sort of more the alternative left, like anti-fracking, Occupy Wall Street, mm. um, things like that. The two-party system. They actually, the ODNI report quoted my sister saying the two-party system is a sham, and they used that quote saying that Russia today shows radical discontent in the United States. And it's like, who doesn't think that the two-party system is a sham? I mean, that, that's the that was to me one of the weirder yeah. things about it. I mean, most lefties would agree with you on that, that the Democratic mm. Party is, is broken. So I, it's just, it's very surreal. Yeah, I know. It, it just sort of, it just kind of comes off as desperate, too. Um, and and more as just, uh, you know, uh, oh, whatever. You know, we'll just kind of throw it out there. Um, 
Oh, just a little breaking news. Um, the president of the United States has commuted Chelsea Manning's 35 year sentence. Um, yes. So yes, yes, yes. I, I didn't see that. I just saw that right now. I, I, um, I, for, I assumed you had already seen it. I was going to mention it no, earlier. Yeah, that's, no, it's great. Um, fucking great news. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, you know, I feel like a one, you know, kind of positive thing, I suppose. Um, yeah. And, uh, oh, and here we go. To, did you see that WikiLeaks, that uh, Julian Assange has offered to surrender to the United States uh, on the precondition that Chelsea Manning is released? I saw that the, he had said that before, but knowing Julian Assange and his oh, yeah, what yeah. mental state he's in now, I don't know Crazy. if he'll follow yeah, through with that. I, that. I mean, if that's true, that raises even more questions about Assange and whatever operation WikiLeaks is is uh, a part of. Um, uh, very, that's it. yeah. So uh, interesting news right there. Uh, I actually did not expect that from Obama. Um, oh no, me neither. You know, he, he he is so kind of anti leaker. Um, that's that's pretty um, that's pretty shocking. Um, yeah, I know. mean, he could have part. I mean, just just the technicality. I mean, all he did was, I mean, what he did is pretty major. But he did not pardon her. Um, no, she's still a felon. She still have a criminal record. Um, you know, and that's going to follow her around. It's it's almost you know. I mean, I don't know if people remember this, but George W. Bush didn't pardon Scooter Libby. He only no. commuted his sentence, which made Dick Cheney furious, which is right. part of why they think, uh, you know, Dick Cheney and him had kind of had a falling out. Uh, mm. <laughs> but, yeah. no, it's great. No, it's then, fantastic. Then it's a glimmer, to make. glimmer of, uh, of hope. And, and, you know, if, you know, I mean, I, I, people might think this is ludicrous for me to say of being so critical of Obama, but I think, you know, this shows that there's at least some good in him still there. So even though he is the one who imprisoned her and, and put her in solitary confinement and, you know, was overseeing her, um, undergoing forms of various, you know, torture and, you know, strip searches and things like that. So it's kind of a wash, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you got to leave on a high note, right? When you're the president. <laughs> um, and of course, I mean, God only knows all of the other sentences he's commuting or pardoning, you know, all sorts of, Presidents always pardon nasty people that they're friends with, um, uh -huh. you know, in the, in the final days of their presidency. Um, here's something I wanted to get your take on quickly um, that you may not have seen. But apparently, uh, InfoWars, Paul Joseph Watson, uh, is claiming that his source within NBC has told InfoWars um, that CNN and BuzzFeed plot to release the, the damaging videotape of Donald Trump from The Apprentice where he uses the N word amongst other things. Um, have you seen this? No, I haven't seen that. But that's, I mean, I just in terms of who, you know, Paul Joseph Watson claiming he has a source. I mean, yeah, this this this, <laughs> this has been a claim that a lot of other people have made months previous to this. So maybe he has a, a unique source. But even Tom Arnold, um, you know, yes. Roseanne's ex husband, who who was on Celebrity Apprentice, claims that. He knows the Apprentice producers. He still has a relationship with them, and they've been holding on to tapes where Trump says the N-word, and he says they're going to come out. I think he said that on, like, Conan or something. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. He was very public about that. And I think and the N-word that he, you know, he called his sons retards and would berate oh, them, yep, you yep. know, and um, he used a C-word. He was just like a nasty, you know, a compilation of all the nasty things. Um, well, so I mean, I mean I, I, I kind of hope it comes out. I mean, I would love to see a video like, you know, we all love uh, looking at, you know, celebrity sex tapes and things like that. This would be even better. Um, you know, this would be like the Kim Kardashian Kanye West sex tape uh, on steroids. Um, if, you know, Trump using all manner of horrible things. Um, so very interested to see if that happens. But sort of shifting gears, but kind of sticking in with the, this, um, again, this like meme of, of fake news and, and, and plots and, uh, rhetoric and stuff back and forth. Um, I have, uh, I've stopped paying attention to Glenn Greenwald, um, more or less around the time he blocked me on Twitter. Uh, and then certainly when he moved to the intercept, I just figured this guy is full of shit. The whole, you know, some of the stuff with Snowden, um, you know, the Intercept obviously just being this mouthpiece for, uh, 
you know, Piero Midiar and the deep state and, and owning all the Snowden files and whatnot. So I haven't paid too much attention to Glenn Greenwald if he's even writing anything. Um, you know, the impression that uh, people like Ken Silverstein, who uh, briefly worked at the Intercept, have given is, of course, that Glenn Greenwald doesn't really do much of anything other than collect a very big paycheck. And, you know, writes the occasional article where he uh, whines and complains about some sort of injustice. But um, just recently, uh, I, I did see, you know, I think it was like on Twitter, it was getting retweeted quite a bit. Um, some article that Greenwald had penned uh, over at The Intercept where he used the term deep state uh, multiple times and that there was a deep state plot against um, Donald Trump. Then he went on uh, Tucker Carlson's new show on Fox um, where he talked extensively about the deep state war uh, against Trump and that they're trying to, you know, uh, get rid of him and that the deep state is coming, blah, blah, blah. Um, Robbie, what do you, what do you make of, of just that? Again, the like mainstreaming of a term that a few years ago, if you used that, you were a complete kook. And now Glenn Greenwald is on Tucker Carlson on Fox News talking about how the deep state is going after our, our soon to be president. And of course, this is so ironic coming from Glenn Greenwald, who works for the biggest deep state outlet, you know, the newest one out there. Um, so uh, any thoughts on that? And is this sort of like, again, like mainstreaming of alternative thinking and culture? And is there something more to this? You know, like why is Glenn Greenwald even getting involved in this? Like, can he not see that this is just a joke? You know, that this might just be t- in order to rile up Trump, that there's nothing to these reports? Well, I mean, I I, I I agree with him on on some level that it does seem to be because this wasn't just an MI you know a retired MI6 agent who distributed this to the media apparently John McCain himself right. actually had this dossier and gave it to intelligence agencies and they wanted to like they for on some level at least they claimed they took it seriously um which which puts it a little bit beyond just you know like a media like rumor it's kind of a thing so, I mean, but no, it, it is, it is odd. I noticed that too in his last article. And I will say that, um, I've actually liked a lot of Glenn Greenwald's articles that have come out in the past maybe six months or so. I feel like something, you know, I, I complained for a couple of years. I mean, and I still don't really like give the intercept or him a pass for this, but they pretty much stayed hands off of the Syria conflict and Ukraine and the new Cold War, uh, you know, rhetoric building up for a long time. This, mo- you know, the so-called most adversarial outlet um, stayed away from two of the most important issues happening. Um, and I, I just found that, you know, unforgivable. It just didn't make sense to me. And then all of a sudden, I started to see Glenn Greenwald talking about Syrian intervention and how, the, you know, the propaganda trying to push liberals into Syrian intervention, trying to push liberals into, you know, fear mongering about Russia. So I don't know if he had some kind of awakening or he felt like he was pushed into a corner. I'm I'm not sure what this change really means, but it seems like I mean but at the same time I, I think it came way too late. I mean, you know, and I'm not tooting my own horn here, but like Abby and I were talking about this new Cold War rhetoric and how dangerous it was, you know, three years ago. And we, you know, Besides you and a handful of other people that I know of, there didn't didn't seem to be much of a concern on the left for this rising climate of fear against Russia. Um, and you know, now that he's talking about it, maybe other people feel more comfortable talking about it. I don't know. It's frustrating to watch though, because it's you know it's bittersweet if he's. And I, I don't think he yeah. has any. Um, you know, I don't think he's trying to mainstream of, of, of via the ter- term deep state. And I don't even know if he's really using it correctly because when i think of deep state i don't think of you know the intelligence agencies on on, on the, at the top levels i think more of like an internal network operating traversing through our intelligence agencies that has their yeah. own agenda you know that's tra- traditionally what i i mean i don't know if you agree with that definition but that's kind of more what i think of when i think of deep state oh well yeah i mean certainly i mean deep i mean deep state we're talking about someone like uh rex tillerson you know, the soon to be State Department, uh, um, 
Uh, yeah, State Department, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Exxon Mobil CEO, he's part of the deep state. Pierre Omidyar and the Intercept, that is, that is a component of the deep state, in my opinion. Again, these, you know, a, a lot of times very powerful, rich CEOs or multinational corporations with the ties to the intelligence world operating above the law, you know, that is much more the deep state. Whereas I know Glenn Greenwald is sort of making it sound like the CIA. Yeah. Um, which is a component for sure. You know, but even within the CIA, you've got you, you do have people that are genuinely there because they believe in the job. And then you've got people who are genuinely there because they are, you know, part of you know, some secret group that wants to, I don't know, rule over all of us or, so, you know, or, or, or has a, a very different agenda from uh, what is publicly stated. So um, sure. no, I, just, I just found it interesting and, and just kind of again, it's like this whole you know, whatever this operation is uh, going on, whatever this 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 dossier on Trump and the the intelligence report on the whole Russian influence in the election, it does seem to be working. Um, it does. It's so funny, too, because then you see so many people getting all hot and bothered over it. And, you know, you want to just kind of shake them and say, you're falling for this. Even if you're 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 doing this because you you hate you hate the deep state, you hate the CIA what they're doing. It's like running into Putin's arms is, is just, that's what they want. You know, it's also a great way to, to sort of see where everybody stands on all this stuff. So yeah, I don't, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's kind of odd. Um, and, and kind of like, I don't know, pathetic again, I guess, seeing so many people, um, you know, kind of falling for this. Um, Robbie, I was, uh, in the first hour, Tom and I, we were talking uh, a little bit about, um, uh, some of the stuff going on in some of the, the sort of subplots or background stuff in Homeland. And I was sort of t- saying that um, in the Israel-Palestine conflict is going to be, it is going to be some, it's going to be important in Homeland this season. I believe Saul, you know, main character will be in the West Bank or something doing God only knows what. Um, and is that like, Nico Montoya from Princess, uh, Princess Bride? <laughs> um, is he? No. Is it? I, maybe it. Maybe Which character are you talking about? You're talking about like the Jewish um, guy who's like her partner. Yes, with the big beard. Yeah, yeah, he's the yeah. dude on Princess Bride. He's oh, the... okay, yeah, there we go. <laughs> yes, Saul Berenson. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and we, really fascinating too because uh, Mandy Patinkin in real life is actually, um, you know, one of the few celebrities out there that actually um cares about Palestine. Uh, and, and, you know, he's, he's, he's been to the West Bank before. He's, he's met with people from like Breaking the Silence and some other groups as well. So he actually. Weird. You, yeah, I know. He kind of like knows much more and is much more open, um, than other people in Hollywood. Yet he, he's, you know, plays this, this sort of opposite of that on this TV show. Um, and then, um, and I just kind of wanted to get your, your kind of feel on this because I, in my opinion, it does seem like there's something is going to happen. You know, with that conflict, it seems like slowly bubbling up. There's the corruption scandal, which seems like it could maybe even take down Netanyahu. Um, you know, apparently that's what really matters to people is his massive corruption, not, you know, war crimes and the rise of this sort of uh, fascist right wing government under him. We've got the abstention uh, at the U- by the U.S. at the U.N. Uh, condemning the settlements. Uh, reports that Israel was bombing targets in Damascus, which might sound far-fetched, except that Charles Lister tweeted about it, which to me was all the confirmation I needed that it was happening. And then just a few days ago, there was a report out in Ynet, which is the largest uh, newspaper in Israel, detailing a meeting between Israeli and U.S. intelligence officials where the U.S. warned Israel not to share intelligence or to be careful about what it shared with Trump because it could fall into the hands of Russia or even the Iranians. Um, Roddy, any, any kind of like, you know, I know I'm just throwing that at you, but what the fuck is going on with that? You know, that was a really odd one to me. I thought, because I mean, as far as I know, Russia and Israel don't have a, that strained of a relationship. Um, no, I thought that that was fascinating because obviously it's bullshit. That's not yeah. why they don't want Israel to share intelligence with Trump. It has to, it's obviously about something else. And what 
what it's about, we, we don't know. I mean, we, it's, I can only really speculate. Um, I think Israel knows things about the United States that could cause immense damage to it. That's my, that's one of my theories. Um, and it's just based on just the history of what Israel has done in the United States. I mean, and I've mentioned this uh, probably too much if people have been listening to me on other podcasts recently, but I may have even mentioned on yours before, but I mean, even in the nineties, there were fears in the white house that it, the Mossad had recordings of Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky having phone yeah. sex because they wiretapped the oval office phone. Amdocs, a company that was in charge of almost all the major U.S. telephone companies' phone records was an Israeli company that was collaborating with Israeli drug smugglers and the Mossad and actually helped hundreds of ecstasy uh, raids uh, basically uh, not happen because they supplied the information that the DEA and other government agencies were wiretapping some of these ecstasy dealers and gave them a heads up. This is an actual Israeli company that was leaking um, secret information from the U.S. government to drug traffickers. Um, so I, I honestly I don't know what it is, but I think that I, I think that there there are instances where certain countries intelligence agencies have the ability to blackmail other countries, and I think that that in part explains. And this is almost giving the U.S. a pass. We give billions of dollars to Israel. I don't want to. I don't want my um, what I'm saying to be construed that way. That I'm saying that America is being blackmailed, and that's the only reason why it's you know treating Israel with kid gloves. Um, but that relationship is obviously changing on some level, and I I, I don't know. I, it's a good, it's positive um, that the UN, you know, that that vote was allowed to go through, which is really a drop in the bucket when you think about it, because all the vote was was against settlements, which. Hmm which is inside a, an open-air walled-off prison, segregating the, po- the Palestinian population. So it has nothing to do with the fact that the population is completely segregated in its own out open-air prison. It's that Israeli settlers are, set, are trying to settle inside that area in order to basically commit slow-motion genocide and annexation of the entire Gaza area. So I, I, I find it fascinating that, you know, all Obama did was basically stand aside or, or tell the UN appointee to, to stand aside. And it was just an abst- ab- abstaining of the vote, right? They didn't even. Yeah, vote. exactly. No, no. Again, like we were saying with the, you know, commuting a sentence versus pardoning, abstention just means you don't vote. It's not that you're yeah. voting against it. You just simply, you don't show up, you know? Which is. You abstain. It, yeah, which is such an absurdly passive action to create so much yeah. outrage that that, it's interesting how much outrage was generated from that. Um, and I think it's, it's symbolically very important. I mean, and I hope it, you know, I hope that that's the direction things are going to go in, but Trump is, you know, he hasn't said anything bad about Israel ever. So, um, I think that's probably going to be reversed. I wonder if there isn't more of this sort of like fear maybe, um, uh, of, uh, you know, maybe they just don't want to, I wonder if the CIA or the intelligence community you know, reading the tea leaves and whatnot and analyzing the information that they have. What if there is going to be something is about to explode in, in Palestine? You know, some, a wave of violence, uh, bigger crackdowns. What if Netanyahu, what if the corruption scandal does take down Netanyahu? I don't even want to imagine who would fill that void. I mean, whoever fills that void is going to make you, you know, wishing for Netanyahu. I mean, that's how right wing the government around him is I mean that's how like right wing the the quote unquote left is in Israel. You know, no, so I, maybe maybe they just don't want Trump getting any, you know, closer with Israel. This is again the guy who's gonna be he's gonna be a, a better ally to Israel than every other president combined, if you listen to his advisors. Maybe they just don't want, you know, World War Three to happen. Um, you know, in the Holy Land. Uh I, I kinda that's what I wondered with the um this intelligence report, the the Israel bombing targets in Damascus. I'm surprised that didn't make a bigger news. Um, I, I'm surprised a, too. I mean, and that was almost like a weird kind of like, well, we lost. Let's just go bomb the shit out of Damascus, you know, just like a like a fuck you before they went back home, <laughs> you know. Um, 
very odd. I don't know, but it did it did make me wonder if there isn't something simmering under the surface that is about to explode. And I, um, I think Rogers. that there is. I mean, I, I think that's the that's the question: is, is what is it? Because obviously, I mean, all of this Russian stuff being thrown at Trump. I do think it signifies something else. Like, they're afraid he's going to make some fundamental change that's going to really disrupt things. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like I'm, I'm excited for Trump wrecking the system or anything, but there does seem to be, on some level, some fear that he's going to do something that's going to undermine everything they've built. So, and I don't know what that is, what they're actually afraid of. And I don't, I don't, I really don't think it's, it's 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 the Russia thing. I think it, I, I think it's something else, and I do feel like something is still simmering. You know, I thought, you know, if Hillary won, all this sort of propaganda would sort of dissip, dissipate a little bit, or at least the you know the the intensity of it would. Um, and now that Trump won, it, it just seems like it it has nowhere to go. It just keeps rising and going up and up and up. Um, and and it does seem like something is going to come to a head, and whether it's going to be you know, the relationship between the United States and Israel or something else or worse, like a World War Three kind of scenario, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm fear mongering, but it, it is it does feel scary and like things are ready to pop off. And, and I don't really know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I know. I, I Well, you know, I, I was Tom and I were theorizing in the first hour um, that, you know, what if it, it, it's it. What if it that manifests in the form of some new rebranded version of Al Qaeda or Islamic terrorism, and there's going to be some kind of attack? Because I think that's the one thing that will shock Trump. And you know, if there's a terrorist attack, you know, we were saying, what if there's another terrorist attack? God forbid, in New York, what if they blow up Trump Towers or something? You know, um, or, or anything really. It doesn't even have to be in the U.S. It can be. It could be in Israel. It could be at a, a U.S. military base somewhere. That's something that if that happens, then when the CIA comes up to Trump and says, this is what you should do, he's just going to do it. You know, I don't think he's going to think twice. I mean, he has no thought process or ideology uh, beyond whatever pollsters tell him is popular at the moment. So, you know, he will do whatever. Um, and it, you know, it does seem, and I think that is a great way to, because the Russia thing, it's like, where do you go with that? You're going to have what? An open battle between the president and the intelligence services trading back and forth accusations that uh, one of them is trying to overthrow the president and that the other is really a Russian agent. I don't see that going, you know, you can't run a country like that. But if you have a terrorist attack happen, suddenly, yeah, who who's going to be in favor of uh, Islamic jihadis? Nobody, really. You know, no nobody that has a voice in America, at least, um, or has influence in America. So I don't know. I mean, maybe that's that's what's happening. And, and, and perhaps the, you know, intelligence. I think the I, I actually wonder if like the report detailing the U.S. warning Israel, I think it's just more about showing Trump, whether real or or fake, to not so much to the Israeli public or, or to the Israeli intelligence officials, but to the American public that he can't be trusted, that he's shady and that he's corruptible, um, you know, because he Trump is so obsessed with his own ego and with maintaining his grip on power. So every time they question that, that he is actually weak that he was caught in uh, some sort of scandal or something, that he's being blackmailed, anything to delegitimize his um, consolidation of power, I think works for the CIA because it just reinforces what half the country believes, that Trump is a Russian agent, you know, I don't know, he, that, you know, he, he was really born in Moscow uh, and trained over there and then sent here to live as a sleeper agent for decades and decades and got a reality show and all of this. I mean, it's so far fetched. But um, I mean, I'll, I'll say this. There was like um, a guy I know who's posting on his social media all of these like crazy articles, uh, you know, about praising Hillary Clinton and, um, you know, and based on the fact that. Well, she's against Russia. And I remember a friend of mine kind of confronting him on this. And, and he responded by just saying, um, you're either with the CIA or you're against them. You know, 
<laughs> and like that's the like and that's like a, a normal ass person. You know, that's like the level to which people have been pushed. Um, but so I think I don't know. I think we need a, um, a like what's the a catalyzing event, <laughs> you know, to to kind of get everybody back on track. And I think terror, you know, Islamic terrorism is the best way to do that. Um, we're, we're very primed for. Yeah, that's the that's the sad and scary thing about this is all this. All these um, things that have been put out there to push people into these bizarre mindsets, like thinking the CIA is infallible now simply because they hate Trump so much, um, that's going to prime us for being in a very vulnerable and weakened position if there is another terrorist attack or alleged terrorist attack in the United States. Um, mm. Because, the, I mean, what are they just going to believe everything the CIA tells us again? I mean, I mean, look at what happened after 9/11. We I wouldn't say that the public was very primed at all to trust in George W. Bush. In fact, he was considered a joke. Uh, (laughs) And when 9-11 happened, all of a sudden, everybody treated him like a god. Don't make fun of the president right now. Let him do his job. You know, it's time to be patriotic. And And that was a population that wasn't necessarily primed for being in that and as vulnerable position as we are now. Um, so that's the, the, what scares me the most, um, I think, is just, you know, what happens if there is something like this under a Trump administration. Even if you think he is, has noble intentions and he is somehow going to do, be a good president, he, he, he is, his ego and his rhetoric about Muslims is already, you know, fully out there. Um, it's, it wouldn't be very hard. The ingredients are all there f- to push him into doing something really dumb. And, uh, you know, possibly acting more crazy and more fascistic than George W. Bush. So, you know, I think Donald Trump could be pushed into being a fascist president. I don't think he is now, um, but I think that it could happen. Um, but I don't mm-hmm. think that he's responsible for that. I think we have already laid the groundwork here for fascism. Just because we didn't feel fascism after 9-11 directly doesn't mean that all that framework that was put in place won't catch up to us eventually and ensnare us in a fascist system. It, the groundwork is already all there. It's just a, mm-hmm. To me, it's just a matter of time um, before we feel it. Um, and maybe that mm-hmm. sounds too dismal, but, I mean, it's it's true. No, I... Uh, uh- that's a that's something that I, I've been struggling with when you you see people in the alt community or or whatever. I mean, it's like almost like these labels mean nothing. But you know you know who I'm talking about. I'm not. I am generalizing, and I know some people on YouTube didn't like uh, some of my generalizing comments recently. But whatever. Um, but you see them, and they're talking about all these great things that Trump is going to do when he comes in, and you know, my question is, was he going to get rid of all of the draconian laws that Obama has already put in place? You know, is he going to sign in statements and get rid of them? Or is he going to keep them in place like all presidents do? And like all presidents, he's going to make them even crazier for the next guy. You know, for when Kanye West runs in 2020. Um, Like, is that it's like, you know, I mean, like, as you were saying, the, 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 the Trump is not a fascist leader, but the. All the things are are in place right now for him to become one. I mean, it, it's funny again. He, he wants to his um, his general sense of like let's not be so involved in foreign affairs, but let's put a you know every Muslim on a database in America. Let's build a wall. You know, um, uh, now I had lots of issues with Ron Paul, but was you know a Ron Paul supporter uh, when I was younger and whatnot. Uh, but one thing that I do, I did, I, I still point to with people is every time the whole thing of building a wall came up, what was Ron Paul's response? What if that wall is to keep you in and not to keep people out? You know, exactly. like, come yeah. on. I mean, it's like right there. But suddenly if Trump is, oh, we got to build a wall. We got to do it. We got to do it. We got to put everyone on a database. I mean, that's like, why don't we just set up the FEMA camps right now? <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and um, I, but Seemingly, that's just like not on the radar. I, I don't know. Um, well, that's that's the that's the most unusual thing to me about like at least Ron Paul, you know, is staying true to his own principles on on the level where he understands that Trump is not a civil libertarian at all. 
But for some reason, people like Alex Jones and people in the alternative, you know, right wing, sort of right leaning media, libertarian media, have fooled themselves into thinking that he is simply because he said things against the Iraq War. Um, mm. He wants to make friends with Russia. He's never said anything about, you know, our civil rights crisis or how we need to, you know, bring back civil liberties. He, I haven't heard him say a goddamn thing about that. And that to me is one of the most fascinating things because Alex Jones was complaining about the police state for the whole time I had been paying attention to him in the early aughts, and now we have a guy who wants more law and order, more more mm. crackdowns, more you know following the law. He likes to say, um, and and that's going to amount to a lot of really bad things for civil liberties in this country or libertarian ideals like. Um, like sex workers, um, I, I, I fear that that's going to be cracked down on quite heavily. Um, uh, medical marijuana, people don't oh, seem to be worried about yeah. that at all. Who, did, who was Trump almost going to pick for his VP? One of the only GOP candidates who had an overt anti-medical marijuana stance. Jeff Sessions, his pick for, what is it, Attorney General? Yes. Said that he liked the KKK until he found out that they smoked weed. I mean, that's an actual <laughs> quote. So these are the people that Trump is surrounding himself with. We might be in for a really rude awakening on the coasts here. You know, people in Colorado and Oregon, Washington, California um, might be in for a very rude awakening, and we're all just worried about Trump being a Russian Manchurian candidate. I'm more worried about him completely throwing any civil liberties and that progress out the window and actually reversing it and 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 taking away rights that we've been given in sort of a more lib socially liberal era to me that's the mo that's one of the biggest concerns you know other than a terrorist attack drawing him into a you know a George W Bush style you know fascist path so no, no. The, I mean the the medical marijuana, the I mean, marijuana legalization. All that. I mean we've, we've got dispensaries here in New York. I mean, there's just no way under a, a you know a sessions in there that that's going to fly. <laughs> um, and again, it's it's just so ironic. All of these weed smoking libertarians that just are pretending like it's not happening, you know, or, or not are not sort of holding sessions to the flame with that. You know, there, it's all this like, well, wait and see, wait and see. You know, we just got to see what's going to happen. And, okay, we can do that. But, you know, you really think Jeff Sessions is going to change his mind, you know, and just like roll up a doobie and just be cool with it all of a sudden? No way. Come on. Like, be realistic, too. You know, I, I know I'm like, you know, kind of ranting here. Um, but, uh, I mean, yeah, I guess I, 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 <laughs> I hope that not every single episode of the radio show will be devoted to uh, discussing Donald Trump. I guess it's just like, again, this is like this, this interim period, this transition period, again, is like a new precedent. This is the longest fucking election in my history on this earth, and this is like the longest transition period. I mean, did you even have a sense of like Obama's transition? Um, no, like not at all. I remember when he was first elected, I remember, you know, there was like the New York Times magazine, um, the whole issue was photographs of his cabinet. But that was it. You know, beyond that, I had no real concept. I mean, I paid attention, you know, because I, I was a, a poli sci major. But it wasn't like a day to day soap opera of, uh, you know, who's going to say this? Who's going to say that? Oh, is a, is a tape of Obama using racial slurs going to come out? It, it's it's crazy. Um, again, the, the level to which this is all. It's like nonstop stimulus. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's probably only going to get crazier, but back to the domestic thing, I think that's the real fear. Um, and it's almost kind of like, who cares if he's, um, you know, and not to be so flippant, I mean, we should stop these foreign wars, but who cares if we're all, if it's like a war zone here in America, you know? Uh, I mean, it, it's great. Yeah, we're not bombing other countries, but if they start rounding up Muslims, <laughs> you know, and and imprisoning um, people for marijuana, that's that's a step backwards. Believe me, um, I don't know how you can really kind of wrap your head around that. Um, I don't know, Robbie. Any we should try and end up on a on a more positive note. Any any positive things you want to leave the listeners with? Anything you're excited about? It doesn't have to be related to politics or anything like that. Well, I, I guess it is a little political, and it kind of relates to what I've been 
focusing on for the past few years, but um, it, it, it seems like, you know, as bad as all of Trump's picks have been in his cabinet, um, there is the notion in Washington, D.C. that the neocons have been completely kicked out of the club. And mm. and I only say this because an editorial just came out in the Washington Post that to me almost seemed like it was trying to signal to Trump, hey, we're still out here. We said we hated you before you won, but we're still willing to work with you, and we're sad <laughs> that you're not inviting us to the table. And I and it wasn't written by a neocon, but it was sort of written with all these anonymous quotes from neocons and actual people who were willing to go in on in print like Elliot Cohen, I think even Max Boot said something. Um and they mentioned specifically they said there were two letters, the War on the Rocks letter, which is like a PNAC 3.0 style letter. I don't know if you remember from the very heavy agenda. It was like the, the project for the anti-Trump century, um, letter where over 120 signatories signed. Um, apparently this editorial claims that all those 120 signatories are on a blacklist that uh, the Trump cabinet has put together. Now, you know, I mean, that's a good thing, um, because these people should not have jobs think tanks and neocon think tanks should become obsolete, but I don't know if it's necessarily, I mean, ultimately I think these people are too clever for that to matter. Mm-hmm. Somehow they're going to sneak back into spheres of influence in the Trump administration, get back into power, stay in power. I don't know how they're going to do it, um, but I think more likely than not as Trump is maybe just playing a game with them right now and maybe wanting them to grovel back to him one by one. I, I don't know what it is. It could be just a, an ego maneuver. Mm. Um, but that's an interesting development. I mean, and they're still fuming about it. Um, this, uh, this editorial came out, I think, a couple of days ago. So they're all very upset. Some of them actually think they might not have jobs anymore. Um, oh. in, 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 in think tanks. So, um, but, you know, that's just one small slice of this. So I, I don't know what, you know, if that's going to have much of a positive outcome in the long term, but, um, but I'd like yeah. to think it might. Mm. I, I do, I do kind of tend to think that Trump is just waiting for them to crawl back to him, you know, and, and kiss his feet and apologize. Cause I mean, seemingly that's what everyone else has done. Um, you know, yeah. I, I, I couldn't believe that Carly Fiorino, uh, went back there to grovel to Trump. Who's not, he's not giving her a job, you know, why, why yeah. did he even go there? He called her basically an ugly bitch on national TV, okay, to your face. And then he was too chicken shit to actually say it right when you were there. You know, he, had to, he said it on a mat in, in Rolling Stone or something. But he couldn't say it to, to her face, okay? Yeah. At least if you're going to be a misogynist asshole, you know, do it. Own it. You know, <laughs> like, you know, be upfront about it if you're going to be a horrible person. But he couldn't even do that. So, I, yeah, I wonder if it's – because obviously, like, John Bolton, I mean, there's some neocons in there um, uh, that have, uh, I, you know, I guess I guess they, they've they appealed to Trump enough that he's he's willing to work with them. Um, and apparently all those neocons don't exist uh, to the alternative media or somehow they're they're the good neocons. They're, you know, born again or something. Um and and just uh just quickly as a, as another aside, there's like all this interesting news popping up. Uh, the, a senior Russian official has just accused the United States Federal Bureau of Investigations of trying to blackmail a Russian diplomat who was attempting to purchase anti-cancer drugs in an American pharmacy. Uh, this was made uh, live, uh, I guess, a few days ago, um, but it's only been you know kind of widely not widely reported. This is on like Intel News. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, just again, this, this sort of stuff happens all the time, uh, with everybody. Um, everybody blackmails everybody. Um, Robbie, quickly, before, um, we, uh, we run out of time, uh, let the listeners know again where they can go to find your work and let us know if you have anything, uh, that you're working on coming up. Uh, you can check out my documentary film series, A Very Heavy Agenda, about neoconservative influence after the Bush administration and our build up to a new Cold War scenario and um just check out my uh twitter feed at florist um i have some irons in the fire right now but nothing's been announced yet so stay tuned okay excellent <laughs> excellent thank you so much robbie i will be coming back to you 
uh, next week with uh, Hugo Turner. We're going to be discussing Ted Shackley and much more. So stay tuned for that, and I will be talking to you very soon. Thank you. News and information you can trust. This is American Freedom Radio. Freedom Radio. Radio. American Freedom Radio.